So hello and welcome to the Thrive London panel discussion exploring emotional resilience and the obstacles and challenges we might face in how to be resilient and remain resilient as well. And I'm really, really excited to be here. I am Dr. Ryder Modgill. I'm a GP and a broadcaster on TV and radio. And one of my big passions is around empowering people to stay well and empowering people to understand themselves a little bit more about what they can do in their day-to-day -day lives to feel well and feel good. And I'm really delighted because I've got a fantastic panel of people here today. You may know that Thrive London uh, did a 20 minute training video with myself and with some incredible Londoners exploring what resilience is, what tools they use in their day to day lives and their tips and advice as well. And we have got some of those incredible Londoners here today with us for this panel discussion to take that training video one step further. So I'm delighted to introduce them. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and a little bit more about who they are. So first of all, I'm going to start off with Carrie. Hi, um, I'm Carrie Scott. I'm actually an occupational therapist, but I'm more an enthusiast of life and um, all things uh, health and well-being and uh, very much um, an advocate for um, good mental health. And uh, that's where I've sort of really impassioned about the aims of Thrive. Amazing. Thanks so much, Carrie. And next is Angelo. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Angelo and um, I am the chair of a charity called Humanity and what we do with these charities um, devise a number of projects that help people become more included and integrated in the fabric of society. A, a, a mental health is particularly important as we all know right now, so um, our current project has been geared around mental health and to stay resilient and to stay healthy. Fantastic, thank you, Angelo. And uh, next is Andrea. Hi, thank you. My name is Andrea. I'm actually a school teacher, but resigned from school due to my own mental health illness. And then I was, you know, infused by what I learned, and so I set up my own organisation called Focus on Creating Your Ultimate Self. Um, focus for short CIC and that's about educating and empowering young people about the benefits and um, importance of physical and mental health. I'm so happy to say as well that we've just been um, awarded to be the first the pilot for a young women mental health and well-being hub in East London so I'm really happy about that and I'm also a transformational life coach and a resilience practitioner so this is really up my street and exactly what I do so thank you and I'm grateful for being here amazing thank you so much Andrea and congratulations and last but not least Jess hi uh, thank you for having me here I am the founder of a mental health support community called run talk run and we host weekly five kilometer gentle jogs for people to have a safe space to talk about how they're really doing um, and connect whilst moving together um, so yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Wow, amazing. So I don't know about you, but all, all from hearing all your stories and what you do, I got sort of shivers down my spine there because <laughs> whenever I hear anything that's positive and good and anything that people are doing in their community and bringing people together to actually change not just people's lives the better, but also change how our communities work, I get really excited. So thank you so much for all being here. Now on this panel, we want to take the training video a step further. We want to understand a little bit more about your stories and the experiences that you shared um, within that training video, but we also want to uh, move it forward into perhaps obstacles, challenges that we might be experiencing in terms of our mental health and our resilience. And obviously, as we said, you know, the, the last year, the last 12 months has been really really tough for all of us and so we've all had to kind of dig deep I think and really understand myself included what makes us resilient and what we can do to not only help ourselves but help each other as well so I would love to delve a bit more into your stories that you shared within the training video um, and some of the advice and the amazing tips and strategies that you also shared with everyone out there so perhaps Jess we can start with you can you tell us a bit more about what you shared on the video of course yes um so uh, as the pandemic sort of hit us, I, I found myself unemployed. So threw myself wholeheartedly into that mental health support community that I, I mentioned, Run Talk Run. Um, so basically put my time into a lot of voluntary work um, and connecting with the other volunteers who are also providing those safe spaces 
and that became like a real focus and something to hold on to um over the last sort of 18 months well forever <laughs> um yeah. but yeah that's kind of been the thing that I've kind of thrown myself into to look after myself um it's given me a sense of purpose and has helped me stay connected to people who share the same values as me mm, that's a, that's really amazing and in, in, in terms of volunteering, we hear, we're we hearing a lot more, thank goodness, over the last sort of year about how volunteering is actually really good for our own mental health and not just obviously good for the people that we're actually supporting in our volunteering work. What, what kind of day-to-day -day impact did you sort of find that it had on your mental health and your well-being? Did you notice any sort of small changes when you first started? Yes. So for me and my mental health, sometimes I find it really hard to show up for myself. But in, in showing up for other people, I inadvertently end up looking after myself. And what I mean by that is reaching out to someone within that community under the guise of doing it for their well-being ends up being exactly what I need for that bit of connection to. Um, so there's that sense of it. It forces me to connect people which is obviously very good for our, our mental health, but it also provides some structure for me as well. Mm. So if I, if I commit to scheduling like certain parts of my day to volunteering, then it provides that routine and structure that I, I definitely need um, to feel well. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Jess. And um, I mean, definitely can relate to that sense of needing a routine um, when the whole world has changed around us and everything that we once knew is completely turned upside down. I think finding a routine and a structure is kind of really helpful, isn't it, in terms of making us more resilient to challenges. So, so at least we've got those kind of touchstones in our day when we know that that it will happen or that's something definite that is in my control. I also loved what you said as well about how um, when you're kind of helping other people connect, it actually helps you connect yourself. Because I know that obviously when I give tips and advice and I, I actually listen to other people's, I'm not only helping myself when I write an article or I speak about something, I'm actually kind of reinforcing that for myself as well. So I think sharing information, which is why this panel discussion is really great, also helps us, us also. Thank you so much. Um, Andrea, perhaps you can share your story and some of your tips that you shared on the video as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so... For me, the lockdown was devastating because I'm a British champion bodybuilder. So that meant that there was no gyms and I had to find a new way to, to keep active. And that new way was going for walks. And it not only helped with my physical activity, it also helped with my knowledge of my area. I happened to stumble across a massive uh, green area space, rivers that <laughs> I didn't know existed, um, <laughs> which sounds really silly, but it, it, yeah, I did it. It was literally on the, my back um, back door. And um, so I, I found that. So going for walks, and I still do it now. In fact, I did so much of it, and I do do so much of it, that I've uh, myself and a, a colleague, we've created a podcast called The Catwalk. And that's to support and encourage. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, and so it, it's to support and encourage um, other people to to just walk in their power, especially women of color as well. That's mm. you know to walk in their power and just just walk. Don't walk for just don't always have to be walking to work or walking to the train station, but just walk for your health, and mm. just be uh, just be present. And so that was literally some of that's the tips that I gave on the videos, just to yeah to walk get some fresh air, get your body moving, because a lot of the times we're here on Zoom meetings and whatever. And so I think that, that that's a good way for me personally to get my day started and it really uplifts me. Yeah, and I loved actually when you shared that on the video because again, it's a simple thing, but it's something I think we all forgot. We, we kind of just forgotten about. We kind of forgotten about all these sort of basic things that we know are good for us, but life was busy. We were rushing around. We weren't noticing nature around us. We weren't really kind of taking the time to do those simple things. So I think actually the, sim the simpler, the better because that's in our control. And when everything's really stressful and our sort of reserves of resilience are kind of being drained away, those simple things can help us sort of top up as well. And and like you, I discovered areas around me that I never even knew existed. I, I'd be out on my bike and I'd be like, I normally turn right, should I just turn left and see what happens? And I was like, oh wow, okay, I never knew this area existed. So I, I absolutely love that. And again, I think another thing that's really helpful is around the, the sort of idea of choice. So in those moments, although it's difficult to make good choices sometimes for ourselves or choices that will make us feel better or help us, um, I think it's that thing where 
the choice to kind of get up and, and go out for a walk is that moment to moment thing that we do have some control over as well. So that's that's really helpful. Thank you so much. And I love the name about the catwalk. I remember when we were first allowed, I think back in the first lockdown to go meet one friend outside. And I, I joked to her that I was gonna go and get dressed up, you know, like I was going for an, a night out for a picnic <laughs> in the park. So the catwalk idea really resonates with me. And I just put as well that it's the catwalk because we are all role models for somebody. And yes. that's the, that's the, that's the link I love that. It. So sh show show your show your skills and show who you are to everyone else. So I absolutely love that. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Angelo, can you share your tips? Being creative is very important because that way you are able to express yourself and you are in touch with your feelings. And so I was able to be as creative as possible through the charity because. I, with the volunteers, we came up with a number of cartoons, for instance, that were geared around mental health, depression, anxiety, how to overcome these issues, overcome health, deal with issues like this through the simple cartoons that we created and, and animated. But creativity is good. There are things that often are be beyond your control, like, of course, the pandemic, and the pandemic has caused the loss of so many loved ones, and this happened to me. And so from that moment, I was not as focused as I would have liked to have been. And as Jess said, structure is important. Um, and that structure begins to get faulty the moment your emotions are no longer in check. And so <clears throat> the it was by sure accident that I came across an object that is important person had given me and um, uh, I have access to this trinket often and um, and it was incredible I know that some um, people say we should not we should remove ourselves from material things we have to keep um, I just say we have to keep the memories within us alive well you know that is also true but when you lose someone so important to you you're looking for things that remind you of mortality that you, you know, you, you have that person existed in your life. And so touching this object, feeling the object, got me in touch with good feelings, positive feelings, the love I shared with that person. And so this is what I do in the mornings to start my day is to think about, gosh, how, how lucky I have been to have met this person. Mm -hmm. But I often think of people that have not been as fortunate and they may not have the trinket to take them back to that person. And I mean, in fact, I've, all, I've, I've not always been so fortunate. And so I think we, we can visualize maybe situations that can take us to a happy place, a nicer place. And so when the trinket has not worked, I have had to visualize situations that took me to a happier place. So that's, that's me really. Mm, wow, Angelo, thank you so much for sharing that really personal story. And, you know, I, I'm sure you would have helped a lot of people watching as well, obviously who've lost people during this awful time and, and and also people who've lost people you know before the pandemic but obviously the pandemic has made that worse for them in terms of their grieving and bereavement because it can not only have we felt so alone during this time but obviously grief can make us feel even more alone so i think that really powerful story of how you connect with that person that you've lost your memories um and and that sense of kind of feeling connected to that person and feeling connected to that love and the gratitude that you know you had for them being part of your life and i also really love your um idea around using your visualization or imagination to take you somewhere for that kind of mental and emotional break or space uh, so it's away from certain things and i think so often we use our imagination to scare ourselves um and we we use it um you know or we it's kind of being it's using us if you like to to, to create more and more fear um but also we can use our imagination like you say to actually take us to a happier place, to a place where we feel safe, we feel comforted, we feel grounded. And I think that's a really lovely tip that everyone can use. So thank you so much for sharing that. 
thank you. Um, and Carrie, can you share some tips and advice with all of us and everyone watching about what what you what you've been doing to keep yourself resilient? Um, well, my my role at work is to run an allotment group for health and wellbeing. Um, and so come March last year, suddenly we weren't growing everything that we wanted to grow. And that year, that loss of, you know, the, the life that would have been, um, you know, it wasn't the opportunity wasn't there until at least July again. Um, so in, in order to sort of continue that support with those that do attend the group, I did a newsletter, just sent it in the post, you know, Zoom was all just happening and people um, were just getting used to that. So went back to basics with sending a newsletter out and really about not just the gardening aspect of the group, but also looking at just nature as a whole and trying to encourage everyone to go out and, you know, because walking or outdoor activities became more the sort of mainstay of what you can do to support yourself, then, you know, it was really encouraging that mindset that, um, you know, that if you were taking a walk, then, you know, go slowly, you know, where are we all rushing to and, you know, you know, stop and breathe and look at the sky and see what the vegetation is around you and, you know, um, just looking at the different campaigns to do with environmental issues and, you know, the butterfly count and all of those things that just embraced people with their local natural surroundings and even to the degree of, you know, what is a hedgerow? You know, there's mm. actually an ecosystem in a hedgerow and I never really knew that. So, you know, sharing that information was really important and sort of that connection with your surroundings. And then, you know, so that was the way I sort of kept work alive. But certainly for myself, you know, I couldn't go to the allotment either. So just like that weekly activity where I couldn't get my hands dirty was just, it was a strange experience. And so um, I did actually commandeer a stretch of land where, um, which is next to the flat I rent. And uh, with a bit of an agreement that I could just rip out all of this horrible grass that I've been staring at for ages <laughs> and a hedge that was prickly that my son didn't like. And, you know, it just wasn't looked after. And I don't like, you know, and I could only bear it because I had this other area to go to, you know, that and I didn't feel that I could take responsibility for that space. But because I was there so much more and, you know, we were starting to enjoy the outdoor space, the communal garden, I couldn't bear looking at it anymore. So I did take it all out and um, I made myself some um, raised planters and, you know, just very basic gardening, you know, nothing too elaborate, you know, just getting some seeds, putting them in pots, nurturing them every day and seeing them, you know, this this very you know, a neglected stretch of, you know, one foot by six change into a, a really well um, uh, sort of established vegetable garden, you know, and it, it's not really in keeping with our surroundings at where I live because it's usually roses and, you know, nice bulbs and flowers and things. So all of a sudden there was sweet corn growing on the corner of the, hat, the, the flats. And it was just like, and then, you know, occasionally I get people come round the back because we were obviously accessible to all. They go, oh, what are you growing there then? It's like, oh, well, you know, I've got pumpkins and, you know, sweet corn and, you know, and peas. And, and then also it's just like daily, once obviously it got growing and producing stuff, you know, I could have salad, just step out the door and cut some salad leaves and the peas and you know and it was so so much closer than you know I, I feel that I am an outdoorsy person but when I've got an opportunity to bring it closer to myself and actually use it and feel it every day that it was just really <clears throat> excuse me it was just so much more personal um, and so yeah I'm a huge advocate for um, utilizing green spaces I think there's not enough done to use green spaces um, and to help people access them and so you know from my own experience learning what I can do with a really small stretch of land you know I say oh my god there's so many opportunities and you know I think yeah, that that is one thing that's really kept me sane actually mm. yeah oh I love that thank you for sharing that and again it's that idea, isn't it, about how nature is has always been around us, but we haven't necessarily 
stopped and looked and looked around to find it and and like you say how we can uh, help everyone access those green spaces no matter where they live um or uh, perhaps um you know even if they haven't really experienced that before you know how can we you know, look out of our windows at the sky and the birds how can we go to our local park how can we like you say like you did amazingly transform a patch of, of land and take the initiative to contact someone to say hey can i do this uh, and grow grow our own vegetables as well which is all about self-sufficiency and i think also nature as well has been um an amazing thing to help us feel like there's something moving forward in a time when we've all yes. felt very stuck and very stagnant. I think when we see the seasons changing and, and plants growing, we feel like, okay, something is moving. And I think again, for our mental health and our emotional resilience to feel that kind of sense of hope that something is changing, I think has also mm -hmm. been really helpful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Wow, incredible, incredible, not only stories, not only people, but also just incredible tips as well. And a kind of incredible takeaways for people I think watching and myself included. I just wanna move on now to talking about we obviously we explore what resilience is and, and kind of how we might be able to develop that and how it's so individual for all of us because we're all unique. And so we learn a little bit more about ourselves and what we actually enjoy and what helps us become more resilient. But I want to move on now to the other side of that, which is just important to discuss, which is the challenges and the obstacles and the pitfalls and those kind of moments where we know what we could do but actually we find it harder to do so i want to move on to talking about those and again i'm going to just open this up to all of you um just to kind of um to discuss and, and bring in the points you want to raise as and when you wish really just to say you know what what obstacles have you experienced in your own life um in terms of resilience and in terms of putting those strategies into play so big one um if i'm allowed to say that you can start the day with all the love in the world, the positivity, the resourcefulness, and it can take just a second or two or an email to come through to destabilize you, to take you off course. And then you really, I'm speaking for myself, of course, it, it does take me, quite a while first to understand what what is this challenge because often it's not really a big challenge but because of these the the, the lockdowns and the continuous uh, negativity that has been around us small things can can come across as being big issues and this is one of the challenges that i personally face on a daily basis, because as I was saying earlier, I do have, um, I do start the day with so much creativity and, and love, really. And, uh, but unfortunately, it seems that um, we may attract the people that don't like love, don't want to be loved. And, um, and so um, we may, or I may be confronted by situations that challenge my, my own values. And so I have, to find always ways of protecting myself and this is hard mm, Andre, that's a great point and, and i think it's that that difference between sort of reacting which is a very sort of yes. uh, moment to moment thing isn't it versus responding but also like you say just checking in with yourself and thinking what's going on me what's going on inside me right now after i've read this email i think we can all relate to, to those kind of examples um what's going on you know inside me right now what am i feeling and what then can i do to, to take a step back and breathe and then sort of reset and i think also because we've we've been around less people obviously and uh, been less able to do the things we normally do those small things become really big in our heads because we haven't got the decompression and the ways out that we would normally have to kind of um process those as well I think Andrea, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was um, just leading on for what Angela was saying. So in the mornings, I do my meditation and scribing, and I even started to do yoga. So walking and yoga were my two new things that I started to <laughs> during lockdown. Walking still continued. The yoga, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. But what I did do, and what I'm still doing, in, and what I encourage other people to do as well, is journaling. So with those thoughts that we, that we, whether it be the emails or whether it be, you know, whatever the case may be for each individual, um, you know, I used to have thoughts just, just flowing around in my head and 
that was actually making me very unhappy and in you know creating a, a negative environment for myself and mm -hmm. so I decided to take up um, journaling and so I have a book and I just whatever comes out of my you know whatever I feel to write about I write about sometimes I may not feel like writing so I get out my phone and I do a video I'd never watched a video back but it's just, I'm able to edit then as well, doing a video, you're not only getting it out of your head, you're also verbalizing it. And so, you know, it feels like you are talking to somebody, you know, even though you are talking to, to, to the camera. So that is something else that, that really has helped me during this period. And, and I'm going to continue to use it going forward because it really, yeah, it has, it has actually benefited me. In a, in a big way um, and even just buying different journals like I've even bought one for finances as well so you know sometimes we think for finances we may not um, have enough money to do x y or z but then when you actually write it out you're like, okay if I do that and I do this and I do that and I move that here then you know well that's what worked for me anyway yeah no, <laughs> like, see, you know, whether you know you got a few pence left or whatever the case may be again you can see where you're where you're going and I think that's the most important thing is to to see where you're going yeah we can visualize but if you can actually see it and believe it then it makes life a lot easier as well so that's that's a look that's one thing one of the things one of the many things that I, I love that so it's so sort of self-expression getting it out of your head uh, seeing it clearly and also problem solving which I think is a really helpful sort of strategy and tip isn't it and again it doesn't mean problem solving doesn't mean we kind of get to get to the solution for problems just like that but it's almost like we just start to break it down into smaller chunks which I think is helpful like sort of when Angela was talking about one of those obstacles or challenges being an email or something basically life you know <laughs> things that happen in life are, are all of these obstacles aren't they and um i think sometimes what helps me as well when things happen in life is although it's really hard and i can't always do it a bit like your yoga Andrew, and i think we can all relate to that as well which is an important thing to say because we can't we can't do everything all the time and that's okay too you know we put a lot of pressure on ourselves but i think sometimes one of the things i try to do is is to sort of reframe things to think, okay, this is a challenge. Where's the learning in this? What can I learn from this that could help me? And again, I don't always manage <laughs> at all, but something that helps me to sort of stop and think, okay, what's the learning in this? What's something trying to tell me? What's life trying to tell me? What what can I learn about myself? Um, I think Jesse, you wanted to say something about maybe one of the obstacles or challenges that that maybe you've experienced or faced, or maybe people out there watching have also experienced. Yeah, so earlier on in our conversation, I really identified with what Andrea was saying with the um, loss of the gym. <laughs> um, because for me, I think one of the biggest obstacles has been is that the coping mechanisms that I would ordinarily use. Um, so for me, that's the gym. Um, that's going to my support group in real life, uh, run, talk, run, um, and throwing myself into my work in real life. All of those things are my coping mechanisms. So when I stripped those away um, in a lockdown, it was like, oh my word, what is my identity with without all of these things? Like I definitely attached a lot of my identity to my coping mechanisms. Mm. Um, so I think for me, like a way to sort of overcome that is to kind of just get to know myself again, <laughs> um, to get to know who I am at my core when I'm not engaging at all of all of these different activities. Like I am not the gym and I am not run talk run, but who am I? And I think journaling, again, like Andrea said, has been a really good way to explore that. But just, yeah, digging deep into like what I value and just who I am without all the external stuff. I, I absolutely love that. And you know what, that, that word, you used that word and Angelo did too, values. And that word for the, in the last sort of 12 months has really been echoing around my head in all kinds of different ways around, you know, what do we value? Why do we value it? What's the world telling us we should value? Um, how can we, we reset those value systems to be more in line with community? But also like you say, Jess, how do we value ourselves? Uh, and I think one of the obstacles to uh, those strategies and taking those steps in terms of being resilient is around what we think about ourselves, how kind we are to ourselves, how we treat ourselves, how we think about ourselves. And there's an old kind of phrase in there, oh, just be kind to yourself, you know, love yourself. And I've always been like, well, yeah, I, I really want to do that, but how do you do it? What does it look like? You know, it's not easy. Um, and I think one of the obstacles, you know, for myself included is on those kind of tougher days when you sit there and you think, oh, well, you know, why bother? 
but it's it's sort of like you say sort of stopping and thinking okay well actually I, I matter I care about myself I want to look after myself and even if you can't get there straight away I think it's a, a good question to ask yourself is well how can I be less unkind to myself because sometimes you know being jumping straight to how can I be kind is a bit too much um but asking yourself how can I be less unkind I mean, what does unkindness look like when when I think about certain things about myself or I, or I don't necessarily take myself out for a walk every day that's not being kind to myself so how can I switch that around how can I be less unkind how can I make myself feel like I matter because I do and I think that's really really important so thank you for raising that because I think that's one of the big obstacles for all of us uh, in terms of our self-esteem and how we look after ourselves and those moment to moment choices um I know obviously Carrie you mentioned earlier how one of the obstacles uh, that obviously you overcame uh, because you developed your own patch of land, but one of the obstacles for you is not being able to go to, the, to your allotment and that space where normally you had that sort of mental break. Um, have you have you discovered or, or come across any other sort of hurdles or obstacles in terms of actually keeping well mentally and emotionally? As I think the most recent lockdown has um, brought out more uh, frustration in me and not sure whether I'm just hormonal, but um, mm -hmm. definitely um, there's a there's an edge to the anticipation and waiting for something to happen, mm -hmm. and I think it's partly due to the season of it the being very short days, and now we're getting into spring and everything feels alive today, which is brilliant, um, and everything felt a bit more closed in, but. What was really important that I'd noticed slowly but surely is that checking in with myself in terms of my interactions with others. Um, I'm quite a reflective person anyway. I've got a very good relationship with my partner. And prior to lockdown or prior to COVID, we always should have, would have debriefed about our day at work you know, and had this kind of, oh, they did this, oh, they did that. Mm. And then suddenly that was gone because obviously we're at working at home and then we've got our six-year-old at home as well. And the routine was different, but the same, all, you know, and it was quite confusing in that respect. But all of those annoyances that we would have talked about or the, the things that would have got us down, they suddenly disappeared, but yet there was still then a limited conversation in terms of our day slowly but surely because the routine had our world just got smaller yes. which was just like it was lovely it lovely in a way and you know I've, I've spoke to clients who said that actually having no obligations on them has been really good for their mental health and you know so there's been a certain benefit to it and a, a, a chance to reflect on what is your what was your life before covid what are the things that you do or don't want to have happen again you know what where is your control, sense of control um but as time's gone on it's just like i realized that you know i started to respond to small things that would niggle me that would never have annoyed me before mm. like you know where where the bin hasn't been emptied you know yeah. it's things that were really domestic chores we're all that... smiling at because we, we can all relate <laughs> I think. yeah whether or not the you know the bathroom mat's been taken up after the morning routine and you know that sort of thing and I just realized that I really had to um, bear that in mind. And I could hear myself like a little snap. It's like, <laughs> you know, that sort of, it's like, oh God, I shouldn't have um, said it in that way. Or, you know, I should have um, just asked nicely or, you know, me implying that, oh, well, you know, are you gonna do that today? That sort of thing, which is really me getting it my partner which is not fair <laughs> on him but it, it, I'm trying to do it in a, a way without telling him but it, you know and, and it, not that we have any issues at all with the division of labour in our house you know we, we don't but these are the things that just started um, getting to me but I think the the main focus for me then was to acknowledge that and apologise and actually say I'm not right and I'm I'm sorry that I responded in that way and, you know, and I hope you didn't feel that you it upset you because I certainly didn't mean it to. Um, but just being the first person to admit that I might have not acted as I should do 
Um, and I, I think being honest to myself and how I would feel if somebody were to say, you know, just to keep saying silly things, you know, and, and harassing me during the day, you know, I think it's like would wear me down. So, you know, I, I have to, you know, really, we all impact on each other. And so to keep in check with how we're treating each other is really important. Mm, thanks, Carrie, for sharing that. Because like I say, I think everyone can absolutely relate to that. And, and relationships are one of the factors, aren't they, that we explored in the video as well, that gives us our resilience or helps us remain resilient, you know, meaningful relationships, um, our friendships, our family, with our community. And so like you say, when we've all been stuck indoors with whoever we are with in a household, those relationships can become strained because you know we're all under pressure. We've all got our own worries, our own concerns. And we have less space, like you say, take this out, decompress. And we've also got less to talk about because, you know, I've been saying to my friends on the phone, so what what, what are you going to be up to this week? They're like, um, <laughs> I'm going for a walk. I'm like, okay. So yeah, we've got less to talk about. And again, meaningful relationships, obviously, you know, rely on listening, sharing, doing things together with people. So like you say, I think one of the, one of the challenges has been around uh, our relationships, how we nurture them, you know, and how we actually, like you say, communicate with others. We've spoken, obviously, when Jess was bringing up really powerfully about our relationship with ourselves, it's also our relationship with other people and how, you know, those can, that can obviously has been a real challenge for all of us, I think, in different ways. Um, and, you know, maintaining, I think, relationships and friendships when it's been more tricky to see people has also been um, a real challenge. So again, I think, like you say, how to get over that, sort of be reflective to take a breath um, and to notice like you say when we are becoming more irritable because that's obviously a sign that our reserves are low in terms of our resilience and that you know it's telling us that we need to kind of step out and and kind of refill ourselves and definitely for me I can definitely relate to that in terms of thinking right I'm going to shut the laptop I'm going to go out for a walk I'm not going to talk to anybody um, until I kind of fill myself up a little bit with something that makes me feel better so I think that that touch on that relationships has been really helpful thank you so much yeah can I just add to that just that last bit absolutely like just taking yourself away um last week Saturday I literally stayed in bed I cooked and I watched Netflix all week all weekend like yeah. because <laughs> why not you know and it really helped yes. and this week has been such a productive week because of it you know normally I'm like oh no I can't do that no I binge watched <laughs> <laughs> the trilogy of the matrix and other things that I, <laughs> I had never watched it so I thought you know what today's gonna be the day. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and, and, right. and again that is so true and I think sometimes you know I find the conversation around well-being mental health sometimes focuses too much on right you need to do something to make yourself feel good now get rid of that feeling it's not a good feeling and i think we absolutely need to step away from that and say all feelings are there for a purpose they're there for a reason they're there to tell us something or perhaps we can learn something from them and i think you know what you're what you're saying andrew is that when you you know when when we need to step out and we need just to just to be let yourself be like that if you need to cry let yourself cry if you need to go back to bed do that you know do whatever you need especially over the last 12 months because you know well-being and looking after yourself and making those good moment to moment choices looks very different for every single person but also they look very very different on every single day so i think it's about like you say doing kind of doing what you need to do for yourself in that moment and crying you know, just being, just closing yourself down from the entire world for a period of time, I think is really helpful. So thank you for adding that as well. Yeah, definitely. I just a um, bit opposite to Andrew, actually, because when I do get a chance to not have a six year old in the flat and that my partner has gone out somewhere, no news, no telly, no radio, silence. And because yeah. I see Heathrow is dumbed down in the amount of traffic that's going overhead as well, it's just, oh my God, hearing the birds, just silence. It's just lovely. It's just what, being with my own thoughts of, you know, because constant noise, you know, and I think very much in around London, because it's so busy, you know, we do get used to a certain level of noise, but filter it out. And it's only with the absence of that noise that we realize what we've been bombarded with all the time. But certainly any opportunity to just not have anything happen in, in terms of sound in my home is like, oh, peace. So peaceful. Do you know, I, I put a social media post a few weeks or months ago that just said, 
when it all gets a bit too much, turn the noise down or turn the volume down. <laughs> and a lot of people like that post. So I think a lot of people can relate to what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's amazing. So, so yeah, I think it's really helpful, isn't it, to recognise there are obstacles, there are challenges, even if we have um, stopped and understood ourselves a bit better and worked out a few kind of tools that suit us for well-being. There are always going to be obstacles and challenges to that because, um, like Angelo quite rightly said, the world is around us, and so you know recognise that there are obstacles and some days we'll be able to overcome those some days we might not and we need to take a different path or we need to ask someone for help or you know let someone know that we, we're not we're not able to get over that obstacle alone I think is really helpful you know it's, we can't always do it perfectly and that's another pressure I think we put on ourselves to you know be resilient all the time and that in itself actually drains us of resilience so to recognize that I think is is helpful so just in the last section, I just want to move on now to one of my sort of favorite topics, I suppose, um, which is around connection and how what we do as individuals impacts other people. Because I think, again, in this last 12 months, we've been absolutely reminded and I've, you know, of the fact that we are one world. We are not separate from each other. We are not separate from nature. Everything that we do has a ripple impact and effects on the people around us, not just our friends and family, but absolutely everyone in our communities and everyone really in the world, especially with this pandemic, because we're, we're all interrelated. Um, so that is one of my big passions. And what I, why I love doing what I do is, I think a lot like, like all of you, is that we can all learn from each other and not just by words. Um, words are sometimes really helpful, but words only land with people when they're in the place to hear them or, or something's kind of resonating with them. And it's more about kind of actions. And I'm really interested to hear how um, each of you, when you've put into place your own strategies or when you've just started doing those day-to-day -day things to help yourself stay well, has that had an impact on the people around you? Um, and also, have you noticed anyone else in your life who has, develop strategies that you've learned from as well. I really want to hear about those. So, I laughed when you said um, about connections and that was because on Monday, I'm actually doing a summit, for a connection summit. So, so talking about, and you mentioned the word ripple and that's actually my title. So Amazing. my title is the ripple effect of personal connections. Mm. <laughs> so it's so <laughs> um, And I'll basically be talking about my lived experience of, you know, when I did start to form connections and connections for me started from connecting with myself. So when I had my, when I went through my mental health breakdown, um, I was subsequently resigned from teaching and teaching was life. <laughs> teaching was all that I knew at the time. And so I had to reconnect and, and learn who, who, who is Andrea Horber again. And so did that connection and then started to connect with other people um, outside of my my own world and that was about like learning around mental health so that really helped me and not only just helped me but helped the people around me because then I was able to have conversations with family and friends about what I was really feeling because prior to that I wasn't I, I you know I didn't know how to start up this conversation and now having been able to have non-judgmental connections is very very important and that's what I'm a big advocate for um, and so my connections have just keep rippling and I I have a, a man child <laughs> he's 23 so <laughs> <laughs> so the connections with us now so back when I first had my breakdown our connection just went to pot um, and now the connection is just beautiful and so I can see that ripple effect has really had a big knock on effect for him as well. So, mm. you know, it's, it's really has its benefits and not just with him, with my mum and just with the people that are in my bubble that I'm allowed, you know, allowed to have connections with. And it's really, so by me building up my own connections has had a ripple effect for everybody else that I work with, whether it be the young people or the women that I serve as well. So it's, mm. it's been a beautiful thing. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Andrea. Anyone else want to share there how connections impacted people around them? Yeah, um, I'll share what I sort of started to implement the moment I realised how much I was missing routine. Um, I find it so much easier to talk about like my mental health and how I'm feeling and emotions when I'm out and moving. I don't like to be stuck in one place forced to talk about heavy stuff. Mm. So um, I realized quite early on that I was missing talking about 
deep conversations <laughs> uh, and I was also missing structure so I said to the run talk run community I'm going to go for a daily walk at 6 30 a.m I know it's early but if anyone wants to have a phone call with me at the same time at 6 30 you're welcome just let me know and I'll make sure I make a note that you're that day oh uh, I love that and it worked so well because it not just got people on the phone talking about how they're doing but it also prompted them to go for a walk early morning and start their day in a really positive way as well and I didn't anticipate that it would do that I thought most people would probably end up calling me from their bed um, <laughs> <laughs> but they ended up going out on a walk as well on the phone um, so yeah it helped me feel so connected to what we would normally do with our real life run talk runs moving and talking um so yeah I'd say that was probably one of the ways I didn't mean to influence other people but did um, wow well thanks Jessica I was going to say if you can get people out and walking at 6 30 in the morning then you're doing something <laughs> really powerful but that is incredible isn't it and I think um that just shows that when you know you when you do something for yourself or you you find a strategy that worked for you and and also I suppose in your story as well you were um, quite kind of looking for some support with that and solidarity with that as well for you but in turn that also then sparked change of behavior in other people and the fact that they then felt empowered to do the same thing for their mental health and, and it brought the community together so you've got like sort of three or four different layers of of impact there which I absolutely love and I know for myself when uh, during some of the lockdowns I you know when we couldn't see any friends at all we were allowed to go out for one bit of exercise um I would sort of text my friend just before I went for a run or something um to say hey I'm going for a run and she texts back going all right I'll, I'm going for a run in about 10 minutes and then I would then send her a little sort of pic, like a selfie picture afterwards just to her saying oh, I'm back now have you done yours and she'd be like yeah I've done mine and and so I think in, and and likewise with her she really got into gardening and so when I would kind of feel a bit stressed, she would send me a picture of a flower that she'd, you know, in her garden or something that she was growing. And so I think all of those things, then I started thinking, right, I need to get outside more. So I think when you sort of see what other people are doing and their actions, it can really inspire you to, to think about strategies you can try out for yourself. So I, I really like that. Angelo, how about you? The same, I mean, creativity is key in, in everything that I do and you cannot be, uh, creative and not having feedback as to what you are generating and so I think for me um, knowing that what I have created is helping others gives me the courage and the strength to continue along the same lines and um, so this is what is at the heart of um, the charitable work that we do and, um, and, and it is extremely rewarding to be to be working on something that is not work really, it's just creating um, something that um, other people are gonna read and are gonna give you feedback. And if I can make one person feel a little better that day, then I, I feel good about it. And, um, and so this is also how I stay focused. And feeling that um, here is my assistant, Oh, and, um, <laughs> and his name is Tito. And, Tito, um, hello, he, Tito. He he's the one actually that then. Oh, oh. he reminds me that also I have to take time off. I have to think about myself, and um, and so I have to remove myself from the, from the screen and the keyboard look after Tito and so is about finding the right balance but it is so wonderful to be able to get the love back not just from Tito but from the people that you know are part of your group or community and um, and, um, and, and, it, and and it feels good Mm, wow I love that and I love Tito as well <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna nominate him for Thrive London's mascot actually <laughs> but but you know what and it's so true as well I think isn't it like we we talk a lot about how our our behavior might impact other people or changes we make impact other people and vice versa but also you know like you say in the wider scheme of things I think this year really has shown us as well around what are the impact of our actions on the environment our impact of our actions on 
the animals around us on nature on the natural world and vice versa and i think again we're seeing things now or we're starting to have our minds opened up and i'm really glad about this in terms of everything being holistic and everything coming round again and again and how we're all part of the same thing so i absolutely love that and and like you say with obviously you know um your your charity work with jess's volunteering work with all the other work that that both you know andrea and carrie are doing as well i think it's around making our communities feel stronger people feel, feel more connected uh because again it's not just about the actual activity or that that thing you might do to help yourself feel better or even activities that we might do in groups for example it's also about the very nature of bringing people together and that whole side of connection and how sharing our stories and advice and bring people together actually just helps everyone in terms of mental health and it strengthens communities and when people feel valued they feel part of something then they feel happier and they feel like they've got support so i absolutely love that and i love tito as well <laughs> hopefully one day i'm going to meet tito <laughs> um carrie can you share any experiences maybe of, of how you've seen other people around you changing what they're doing day to day and how that perhaps inspired you um maybe something that you haven't tried before or vice versa um well i think in a way the the biggest change in others because i've had limited contact outside our home mm. with others um but certainly going back into work um in july and managing to get the allotment group up and running again you know which was had to be very carefully handled and we we're all doing this two meter dance around each other on the plot which is thankfully big enough but you know when um, I had some lovely feedback about the newsletters that I had sent out in terms of the kind of um, information I was sharing or that they were starting to think about the different areas of their life you know or just broadened their interests you know like one of them was about um, RSPB and bird call and I just encouraged them to go on to a site and listen to bird call mm. and you know one of the chaps did say yeah you know I'm, I'm actually now recognizing the different types of birds wow. you know and, and that you know, that just it, re it was a lovely feeling because it was just like you know it was on a piece of paper I didn't even send the link the link was in you know just ink and paper but yet it still you know led him to really look at it um, and use it and actually appreciate all things you know and moving towards this understanding of his relationship with the environment and what he can do and you know and and that's a, such a lovely thing to feel um mm. that I'd maybe been a part of the thinking process there rather than you know um and encouragement to go out and you know find other interest broaden your interests mm, so wow. yeah I think that was nice to, to get that back and that's been the majority of the feedback that I have been able to get because of the kind of nature of the group where we have time to speak with each other about you know how we're feeling about COVID or you know um, an isolation and loneliness or and then conversations about what we're going to grow next or mm. you know so it's a very broad um, uh, remit to the group um, but certainly that connection, being near each other and speaking, you know, even if it's two metres apart, but, you know, that that connection, um, seeing people, you know, seeing their faces, because it's also at a time where, you know, you could wear, you do wear a mask. We're outside, so it's slightly different. But now we would probably say, you know, you all have to wear masks now because we're, we're the variants changed and all of that stuff. But, um, you know, definitely seeing people physically <laughs> in front of you, you know, and uh, and also I, I, I kind of got this feeling more recently about the sense that we're all, you know, the, the distancing around people and loneliness. And when I pass someone, I actually feel guilty if I'm taking this wide berth and I sense that that person looks vulnerable in some way because there's nothing, nothing worse than see, feeling like people are avoiding you. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> avoiding any close contact. And I, 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 you know, the sense that, you know, we were able to then have this, um, you know, reignite these relationships and have it in a safe space and, you know, have those conversations across the plot. No matter, we got louder, of course, you can probably just <laughs> disturb some other plot holders, but, uh, you know, just the, the ability to just talk freely and, 
being in our environment and appreciate it yeah that that being connected with nature and also connected with each other and just you know those two hours a week um being a really important core part of the week to feel like you're with somebody yeah definitely fantastic that's and i think just also just hearing tips advice not 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 in a formal way but you know just from your friends if you just if you just speaking about what's going on for you what challenges you're facing what's going on for you then um you know just that other person listening maybe maybe giving some tips and answers and sharing their story and sharing what's helped them so that we can learn from that but also i think just um asking questions as well so i think you know the thing about advice is is that it's you know it's choose your counsel wisely (laughs) first of all um don't don't necessarily you don't necessarily have to take that advice but i think if it lands with you or there's something that resonates with you then actually it does kind of trigger off something in you about maybe thinking about your own resilience like what where where am i at the moment with my resilience where am i at the moment with my mental health what's that other person doing maybe i can get some inspiration from them that's working for them maybe that could work for me as well um and then just sitting back and thinking okay well you know i've got all this information now from sharing my my story and listening to other people's stories now what do I want to create for myself in terms of how that looks looks what that looks like for me and I think that's the power of not not just words and sharing stories about resilience but also I think that's the power of when we act and when we actually change something for our own resilience the people around us can see that and they think hey that person's looking a lot happier I wonder if what they're doing might work for me as well maybe I'll give it a go so I think that's the power of actions and the power that we can all have over each other and the power we can actually get from other people as well around us so thank you so much for explaining all of that just before we wrap up I would love real kind of quick fire rounds maybe just one tip for someone who's watching this who perhaps is feeling like their resilience, their ability to kind of bounce back is low at the moment, or they're just not quite sure what to do, where to go. What would be your one tip or one takeaway for them? I think I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the, the journaling or because I feel for me that that works, it, it's free, you know, and it, it gets you out of, literally gets you out of your head. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks, Andrea. And give yourself a hug and value yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, it is important to have consideration for, for, for your person. And so just give yourself a hug today. Thanks, Angela. I think um, for me, when I'm struggling um, with my mental health or I'm in a bad place, it can be really hard to sort of think myself out of it or to make myself feel better through thought so for me actually just opening up my back door and getting a blast of fresh air or having a shower something that shocks my body um is enough to to shift my thinking so yeah instead of focusing just on emotions like what can you do physically that might shake things up a bit that's brilliant yeah how can you use your body to help your mind i love that thanks jess um, yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, definitely following a routine, sticking to it, to, to have that, um, there's a certain amount of uh, sort of um, containment in a routine and looking after yourself, you know, making sure that you, like the, just the basics really, that if you're not caring for yourself, then, you know, it's not going to lift your mood, you know, you, you need to bring yourself up every morning to to this place where you can then take the steps and it you know it might not be a great day afterwards but at least you're prepared for a day um definitely and uh you know otherwise it, I, I would say you know, getting a pot plant <laughs> if you can't have a pet <laughs> get a pot plant <laughs> you know so if you've no garden access or you know just it's having something to care for and to nurture um, and to to be responsible for it is kind of you know it, so pet child plant you know whichever you feel that you can cope with um but it, i think that connection with a living growing um entity um is really important and to you know to be outside and to breathe you know that the the air to take in your surroundings um is really important because if you shut your life down 
and nothing changes every day, then that's going to be harder. But you've got to stick to the routine and get out um, and it, be a part of life. Even if you are sat on a bench watching everything go by, you know, that that's really important. Mm, wow amazing tips i'm gonna write all of those down when this finishes and make sure i do those all today so i just want to say thank you so much to all our incredible panelists your not just your advice and tips but also i think your personal stories that i'm really grateful for you sharing have really really helped not just me but a lot of people listening because like you say when you share your story people can relate to that they feel like they can um hear or see a part of themselves in your story and that helps them feel not so alone but also it helps them to feel like actually there's something i can do to help myself feel better so thank you all so much for sharing your stories i'm really really grateful to you and thank you also to thrive london who have put together this amazing panel about building emotional resilience looking at the challenges and obstacles and looking at how we can overcome those as well thrive london is a citywide movement that's helping londoners stay well in terms of their mental health and emotional well-being and if you want to find out any more of their resources then check out our website. Thank you all so much for joining and we'll see you soon.